I'd like to invite us to turn in our Bibles um, to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. Open up your apps, your iPads, your Androids, your iPhones, and find that scripture if you like. You can follow along on the screen. This is from the NRSV version. But let's, let's listen to Paul as he speaks to the church in Corinth. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, I pray that you hide me behind your cross. Lord, the, the feeble words that I will use, the limited understanding that I have brought to this day. God, that by your grace, God, you will make them sufficient. Not for my sake, not for this church's sake, but for your sake. That in everything, God, you may be glorified. And this word may be a seed in our hearts that will grow and live within us, transforming us each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A few months ago, I was flipping through the channels and came across C-SPAN. Now, for those of you who don't know what C-SPAN is, it's kind of the sports center of government, right? You get to watch highly paid people do their work, minus the excitement and entertainment. And so I was, as I was sitting there watching it, and before I kind of fell off in, into unconsciousness, um, I noticed what this subject was about. They were talking about uh, confirming an ambassador that the president had appointed. And I thought it was a fascinating uh, kind of conversation in the, in the hall as they were working through this confirmation hearing. And what I heard beyond the posturing and all of the political pokes and everything that was going on was kind of this talk about the values of what it means to be an American. And what does it mean um, to be an American today? And what does that mean in terms of our relationship with other countries and the rest of the world? You know, and in terms of freedom democracy, capitalism, bravery, those types of things, those values that we promote and that we live by. And how through this, this, this ambassador and through our foreign embassies throughout the world, how do we live out, promote, and leverage the values of the, of the American people and of our national interest to, to positively influence the world and to do that um, intentionally? Now, as I was reading this passage this morning, I went back to that confirmation hearing because when I read this passage this this morning, it made me think about what Paul saw as the main value for Christians and for our faith. And that's reconciliation. That we as Christians are ambassadors out into the world, that our church really is an outpost in our community. You know, only 17% of people go to church, synagogue, mosque, or any organized religious institution regularly in the world we live in today. 19 if you want to round up in Texas. So there are so many people in our community, so many people that we live beside as neighbors, so many people that we interact with that do not know the life-changing love of Jesus Christ, that do not know the values that the kingdom brings into play, that do not know reconciliation and the hope and the promise that God lays out for us, and that we are ambassadors. We are the outposts in our communities now. No longer are we the center of the world. No longer do we dominate the public discourse. No longer do we have that preferred place and preference in our society, but we are ambassadors and outposts in a world that is hungering for the life-changing, world-transforming news of Jesus Christ. 
Now, each one of us has that power and that, that power of reconciliation in our life, that call to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, to be reconciled to one another, and even to extend grace to ourselves and find peace and joy within our own hearts. And embracing reconciliation is not about one choice. It's about a way of life. It's not about one moment and one decision. It's about intentionally living and embracing the freedom that God offers us through Je Jesus Christ and living our life in such a way that is transformed by that choice and by that lifestyle that it influences and affects and infects the people around us. That in fact, it's so irresistible to people, it draws them in to a relationship with God. For us to be right and aligned with God's heart, that our life and our love is aligned with God's life and love through Jesus Christ. And then in our horizontal relationships, it plays itself out in which we are reconciled to the people around us. Jesus is the incarnation of God's desire for reconciliation, for peace, love, and forgiveness. You know, after I began to learn Spanish, the word incarnation began to mean something very different for me. Because in the middle of that word incarnation, I hear carne, right? Which in Spanish means flesh and meat. So in Jesus Christ, God gave love flesh and bones so that we may experience it and embrace it and engage in reconciliation in a way that, that people had never known before until Jesus stepped on the scene. It is a way and a lifestyle in which even today we would never be able to know if it weren't for the power, the teaching, the death, and the re resurrection of Jesus Christ. Reconciliation is the core value of who we are as Christians. And it is something that we are called to live out and to share and to be ambassadors of in the world. Our churches are outposts of reconciliation in the world, of calling people to a relationship with Christ, of calling people to be reconciled with their brothers and their sisters, to call people to give grace to themselves and to live in peace and harmony. This morning, I want to introduce you to someone who takes their role of giving love flesh and bone in their life very seriously. And his name is Jeffrey Wright. I want to introduce you to him. <laughs> Test question alert. Test question alert. Nope, from the big giant head. I don't fall asleep in this class. I just don't. And it's weird because I can remember falling asleep in every other class. I've never had a teacher like him at all. Like calculus, every day, just, I pass out. Like he's probably one of the teachers, like probably when I'm 75 years old that I'll still remember. RTs, I fall asleep in there all the time. He's the epitome of what I think a teacher should be. Uh, how do you know how far this is right now? You know what, I think, uh, oh. That's what I was afraid of. Okay, <laughs> go ahead and uh, go get that tail for me, please. Mr. Wright has a key to the city. Yeah. I just tend to fall asleep a lot. I, it's a bad thing, but I do. But this class just keeps me interested, so there's no room for napping because you're learning. Quit smoking! <laughs> Careful! Oh, boy. Oh, my gosh. It's like this guy is just crazy. He's just exploding with fun. I don't know, you see a huge fireball burn in my hand and go up to the ceiling and all the matter, I'm not gonna have any kids sleeping and every one of those people are out there asking how, 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 how. And as soon as you get the kid asking how or why, I can rope them in and get that intrigue going. Once again, it's a love of Murray. He says, I could care less about Newton's third law. I want to teach you something for you to take outside of school. That's what he's told us before, so. He really, it's, it makes me feel like he really cares about me, and I know he does. And he's a good man, and he will stick, go out of his way for you. Right, Any last words? <laughs> <laughs> Do you love us? Oh. More than you know. <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. Three, two, one. You know, schools have them for six hours a day, and then they the kids go home, and whatever atmosphere they have around for the other 18 affects them. And so, you know, schools can change a lot, but 
we also have to realize that they go home to a completely different environment. I, I think he could tell with me like I, that I had stuff going on. So he like kind of reached out to me at first. And at first I was like, dude, like you're a teacher. Like I'm not going to talk to you. Like, But I did. What I went home to when I was young is very different than what some of these kids go home to where they don't have a mom and dad or some of these kids, I hear them talk about all the time, where there were gunshots at night. Well, I'd have a hard time sleeping or studying if I knew there were gunshots outside the room. I've pretty much been on my own since I was like 15. So, yeah, I mean, I talk to him about a lot of stuff, like at home and stuff, and he works with me. I mean, I, I've had everything from Mr. Wright, we're pregnant, to I've had an abortion, to I've ran away, and uh, here's what I'm saying. My father is beating me, and here's pictures of the holes in the walls, and you can see where the makeup is trying to cover bruises. I mean, it's, yeah, and it's, it's just very different than, than where some of the rest of us are. That's why one size fits all doesn't work. You know, one size fits all doesn't work. You know, I think that's the genius behind God's plan for you and for me and for the world. Because all of us come from different backgrounds with different experiences and different needs when it comes to reconciliation in our lives. Needs for peace and for love and acceptance and forgiveness. We all have a unique role to play that no one else can play in extending, in, in extending reconciliation to others and embodying that type of love in the life-giving relationship we have with God. Now, when I moved to Dallas in 1998, um, to begin my internship with Duke Divinity School uh, for my Master's of Divinity, I moved into West Dallas, which is a poor urban Latino community. I moved into substandard housing there in the community. Uh, for the most part, I was the only Anglo in the, in the neighborhood, so people always knew where I was and what I was doing at, at any given time. And it was a life-changing moment for me. Uh, because it really allowed me to see the world, to see people, and to see my life and see my God in a very different way. Whenever I was working in one of the mentoring programs with kids who were in gangs, you know, one of the kids there uh, was gunned down on his way to school. And that whole experience changed the way that I saw church and the reason that we do what we do. Um, a few weeks in, I was physically ill from homesickness because I had never been so far away from my family, never been so cut off from everything that I had known and lived in a different place. I was physically ill. And my neighbor, who didn't speak any English, came over with her daughter to bring me soup and left it on the doorstep and knocked on the door. And when I came to the door and I looked like stuff, you know, when I got there. And I remember when I opened the door and just peeked out, the little girl said, are you still alive? You know, but she reached out to me and it changed the way that I understood what it meant to be a neighbor and what, I, what it meant to live side by side with somebody. You know, to live in that kind of place really brought to life what it meant to live in the midst of a community of people who didn't look, think, and act like I did. And it opened my eyes and opened my heart because if God created all of us, then surely to be, in re to be in a right relationship with the people around me meant that I could also potentially be in a right relationship with God. Because if I was rejecting people that God created, then surely I was rejecting God in some way, shape, form, or fashion. And it changed the texture of my life and the posture of the way that I loved. And then whenever I went back to North Carolina, that was a very difficult experience for me. Racism and prejudice runs deep where I'm from. And to go back into a community where the only way they knew how to work and interact with Latinos or Hispanic community was as migrant workers or as factory workers in poultry and, and in pork, you know, to come back into a place and all of a sudden to see people that were once invisible to me or to walk alongside people and, and, and see that the, that the Latinos in my community were invisible to them, but that I saw them in a different way and interacted. It really changed the way that I, I went home and who I was. God was working something out in my life. I was no longer the Chris that I had been, but God, through this experience and through my ministry and, and through his call upon my life, was somehow reshaping me and reforming me into this new creation, into this new way of seeing the world. Now, do I still struggle with prejudice and racism? Yes. Is God still working in my heart, in my life? Yes. You know, I don't know, whenever I moved here, 
Um, uh, you know, Gracie, we've been unpacking boxes and dealing with everything inside our house for the past, you know, three weeks or so. And so we've, we've been doing everything inside. And so we really had not done anything outside the house. And so it was rather uh, a shock to me whenever I got the first letter from the HOA. You know, kind of reminding me that I need to be taking care of, of my house and, and they're going to watch me if I don't. And so, uh, so yes, this past weekend, we took some time out. I went outside and, you know, kind of messed with the grass, trimmed the trees a little bit, cut some things down, and started weeding the, the plant beds. And, you know, I, weeding, my dad did industrial lawn maintenance and, and landscaping for the best, better part of my teenage years. So there's nothing I loathe more than to, than to be doing that outside. So I, but I got outside in the name of Jesus and because I love my wife. And, and I was pulling, you know, there's some weeds you can pull. You'll pull the weed and the root system will come out. And then there's some weeds that are just strategically made to drive you nuts. Because when you pull them, and if you don't pull them just right and if you don't dig deep enough then root fragments will break off and they'll be down in the soil and you know that if you still don't dig deeper and the rain comes whenever it comes in Texas that eventually they're going to grow and those weeds are going to come back and that's how it is in our heart right when we don't when we don't allow God to do the work when we don't reconcile with God and allow God to dig deep into those roots of sin and and brokenness in our life to dig those out then we are going to have those still growing within us, still there, ready for the next time and ready to grow and be there. And God was working those things out in my life. Now, if you get up every morning and you don't think that, that you need God's reconciling love in your life, that there aren't things that are continually competing for God's central uh, place in your life, if you don't believe that there are things that are standing between you and other people and unresolved issues, if you don't believe that there's some brokenness and places in your life that you need to take care of, then let me tell you what, my brothers and sisters, then you're missing the freedom and the fullness of the abundant life that God offers you to be able to live life firing on all cylinders and to allow God to cultivate and draw out of you the best of who you are. Now, we've had a chance to see uh, this teacher, Jeff Wright, and his love and acceptance and how that has impacted the lives of the kids in his classroom. Now, let's take a moment and dig deeper into Jeff's journey and see how his experiences of reconciliation in his life have helped him become the incredible teacher he is today. You want more cookies? A mommy cookie? A brownie? Well, let's go home and see if mom made some. She said she was going to make some, but I don't know if she ever did. Throw your hands at him. Here you go, Adam. Oh, yeah. Bless us, O oh Lord, with these thy gifts which you're about to receive from the bounty of oh. Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Abby is perfect in every way. She's uh, actually 15, not 14. She's 15 going on 25. She's, you know, one of these people that can't stand her dad because he's stupid and a little bit nuts and, and so forth. So I, I, love, I love her to death. When Adam came along, though, we didn't think it was going to be a boy. And all of a sudden, right. a boy pops out, and I'm thinking, wow, this is cool. Now I got a girl and a boy, and not that I really cared, but you get all the dreams of, wow, I'm going to be going to football games, I'm going to be going to baseball games. If they're not any good at sports like I am, we'll be going to you know, plays or something like that. Whatever it be, yeah, I'm going to be there for my little buddy, okay? No, now we have to give her our address. Oh. So what is our address in Spanish? Mm. Uno, uno, doso, doso. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> no. Is that what this is? Mr. Tim. Well, anyway, the nurse comes out and says, this is your boy, and I get ready to hold him. She said, we got to take him back. And I'm thinking, what's going on? She said, he's breathing really, really fast. He was breathing 180 times a minute. It's about three times a second. Still to this day, breathes about 60 times a minute. That's once a second. Think about breathing that fast. <laughs> you get pretty tired after a while, wouldn't you? You get all your homework done? Yeah, yeah. Can you breathe a little better now, Adam? Huh? Does that help? Huh? That help right there? You get a good head of hair. Yeah. Do you like music? Loves music. 
Uh, how, how do you stop music? Uh, oh, come on, come on, no, that wasn't it. That, that was signing time. How do you sign music? Okay, so that's music. Okay. We then found out he was completely blind. Okay. Uh, he was born with something called Jobert syndrome. Only 417 people in the whole world have it. And what it is, is um, it's an autos uh, autosomal recessive disorder where my wife has to have a gene and I have to have a gene that puts us together and it causes this to happen. So I have a completely intelligent little boy, but he can't control what his body does, even though his body is completely functional. The mere fact that right now your butt's on that chair, your butt tells your brain which way up is. His brain doesn't do that. So the mere fact that you can sit down and sit up is a miracle. Let's go. All right, pal. That's it. Keep going. Oh. He is extremely self-abusive. Uh, for instance, uh, if he gets scared or if he gets upset, he'll just start taking his fist and pounding his face as much as possible. If he wakes up and he gets scared and I'm not there, he'll roll out of bed and just start pounding his face on the floor. Constantly take his legs and just pound them on his wheelchair until he gets all bruised and bloody. So when I started getting a, a rap on what all this was about, all those dreams, of ever watching a, my son knock a home run over the fence, went away. And talk about getting pissed at God. I was pissed. Because you know the whole thing about where the universe came from? I didn't care. What I care about is why. And you can pick on me all you want, but when you pick on my little boy, that's wrong. A totally innocent little baby and you're making him do that? I started asking myself, what was the point of it? So as we went through all this, it was Abby that sort of taught me why. One day, I went up to her room, and she had Adam in the middle of all of her dolls. And I'm thinking, what are you doing? She's done playing with my little brother. And I'm thinking, he didn't know how to play. And she said, Adam, she said, like, hand me a doll or something, and he just smacked it. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, if he smacked that, he can see. When did you find out he can see? He said, I don't know, he just started smacking dolls. And I'm thinking, holy mackerel. And so then we started working with him and trying to teach him a little sign language. And there was nothing more incredible than the day you see this. What's that mean? Daddy, I love you. So cool. That's when I knew it didn't care about how things work anymore. It's the reason why things work is because of love. So there's something a lot greater than energy. There's something a lot greater than entropy. It's the fact that what's the greatest thing? Love. That's what makes it all the why we exist. So in that great big universe that we have with all those stars, who cares? Well, somebody cares about you a lot. And as long as we care about each other, that's where we go from here. <laughs> I needed you yesterday. You hear me? Yeah. <laughs> I, you that, I know, it's hard, it's hard. Man, it's a hard story. You okay? I was worried about you yesterday. Yeah. Jeez. I see ya. Wait, Jay. You say juice. You didn't say juice, you said play, right? Huh? Did you say play? You did? What do you want to play? Huh? What do you want to play? <laughs> Pull up! Pull up! Use those abs! Use those abs! Use those abs! Use those abs! <laughs> All right, so much for doing therapy, huh? All right, ready? You gotta have me carry it. That's what I thought. Okay.
What are you grunting for? I'm going to pick up the load. He pulled the dirty old rag from his pocket and threw it up in the air, and the raven would swoop down and grab the rag in his beak. Good boy, Forrest smiled. Now I give it back. No, Chuck, Forrest groaned. You're supposed to return it to me. But he could not get the raven's attention. And total frustration. Why did God send Jesus to reconcile the world to himself? So that we would know the why. So that we would know that there is something greater than power, something greater than entropy or material possessions, titles, fame, appearance, pain, and hurt. That there is something greater than the things that stand in between us and God. That there is something greater than the unresolved issues that isolate us one from another. And that is love. I believe this morning that the power of God's love and relentless desire for reconciliation are shaping our lives even at this very moment. I believe that we all have stories in which God is drawing us closer to himself, even when we're fighting and screaming to push away. I have a belief and a feeling that there is a God who calls us to love one another more than we can possibly imagine, that moves beyond the superficial and the petty, that moves beyond the pain and the brokenness. I believe that no two stories are the same, and no one story is more meaningful than the other in God's eyes, because they all draw us closer to Him. I believe that your story and your journey give you a unique capacity to give flesh and bone to God's love in a life-changing way in order that those around us who are seeking and searching and denying as hard as they can, then we can lead them down the journey of reconciliation. I believe some of us may talk about reconciliation but are afraid of it. I believe all of us have areas of our lives, attitudes, relationships, and pain that need reconciliation and healing. Jesus has come to invite you and me into that type of freedom and abundance. Today can be the day that you draw deeper into the peace and forgiveness that God has for you. Today is the day that you can draw closer to that family member or that friend. Today is the day that you can look into the mirror and love who you see because there is a God who created you and loves you for how he created you. And that we can be a church that can be an outpost of reconciliation. That we can be a church that can show that there is a love above all loves. That there is a power above all things that bind us. And that there is a hope greater than all despair that seeks to drain the life from us. Today is the day. God is God and Jesus has come. That we may know life and know it abundantly. Let us pray. Gracious God, Lord, I know that you are working in powerful ways in the lives of each and every person here this morning. Lord, I know that you are still working on us and God will always be working on us until the day, God, we join you for all eternity. God, may we open our hearts. May we draw from the courage that your grace gives us and trust that as we reach out and respond to your calling of our name, that God, you will answer. And that God, as we reach out to one another, God, your love will be able to reconcile us and to make things right. Lord, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.